Well, come DMA OC members, Orange County, California. Tonight, we have a visual effects supervisor and a director all the way from Utah in the house. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Super excited. Thank you for being here. It's been a while since I've done some stuff because I've been busy with work. So this has been when you were like, hey, you want to come talk? I was like, absolutely. So put something together. It's a, uh, and we're going to walk through it, but I'll introduce myself really quick. Uh, my name is Aaron Sorensen. I'm a visual effects artist, supervisor. I've directed a couple other little things, nothing huge yet, but uh, I'm incredibly passionate about visual effects. And I'm sure a lot of you here are. Uh, I started in more motion graphics back in the day doing After Effects, and that became an obsession and went into 3D, and then that went into visual effects. So I slowly kind of progressed into it, and I've used almost every software there is. <laughs> so I've gone, I've used Maya. I'm currently learning Blender, and I'm loving it. Um, so yeah, I've used Cinema 4D, 3ds Max, Houdini. You know, use them all and I love them all. They definitely all have their advantages and disadvantages. So yeah, um, so I was super excited to talk about a little breakdown of a recent project I worked on. So this is my recent update to my website. You can go here, vfx-central.com. It eventually will be vfxcentral.net. That's, and I just switched over today. But this little uh, dinosaur thing playing in the, on this right side is... A project that I created, it looks really, it was really fun and I didn't do this alone. And that's something I want to talk about, not just the technical skills, but the business side of or the, uh, how to be the best artist you can be. And <clears throat> I didn't do this by myself. I, I worked and collaborated with people that are more talented than me. So I did the lighting and comp in this, but I worked with a talented animator a talented FX artist and a really talented matte painter. So there was about four of us that worked on this project. And that's something that um, I don't think that I, I don't see a lot of people talk about online is collaboration. So what I'm passionate about is the lighting and making it look cinematic. So I found someone that was better than me um, at animating. I was like, you know what? I'm not a super good animator. I love it and I respect it, but I'm just not super good at it. So um, I reached out to this artist named Eddie Chu, and he has his own animation academy. And he and his students, they created this animation, and I was just blown away. I was like, hey, I would love to light render this and make it super pretty for you. And he was like, absolutely. You know, because for him, it's mutually beneficial. So he's like, I'm like, send me over the 3D files. You know, I'll, I'll try to make it look really pretty. And uh, yeah, we can work, work something together on this. And as I started working on it, I posted on Instagram. I said, hey, this is a really fun project. Wondering if anyone else wants to jump on board. And I got a bunch of messages. And I really just needed an effects artist, someone that does like smoke, fire, and Houdini. And um, a matte painter, someone that can make my, my renders look even better. And I'll jump into all that. We'll kind of go. I have a whole process. I'll show you kind of how this works. So, yeah, it was just this cool, big dinosaurs, robots fighting and all that. So one of the things you'll first notice is the quality actually isn't that high. And that was another part of the process I wanted to talk about was I knew that when I was going to render this out, it was going to go straight to my phone. It was going to go to Instagram. It was going to go to like be shown on a little screen. So I thought I'm going to render this in 720p and scale it up to 1080 and that saved me so much time on render time if this is going to you know to the movies or whatever i obviously would do it 2k or above but it's all about context where is someone watching this oh they're going to watch it on their phone then i'm going to not waste render time and i'm just going to render it out in a lower resolution so think about where your deliverable is like at the very end but like where is this going to be played if it's going to be played on the phone like don't do 4k in my opinion and 720p is good, and then you can up res it. You also can bump up a lot of your render, like samples and stuff. So that is, that's the shot we're going to kind of look at. All right. So <clears throat> this is kind of the process that I'm going to talk about. So we start off with like an animation or a layout. 
And when you're working professionally, these are the things you want to lock down with whoever is having approval. Because if you don't lock the layout and the animation down, um, if they make changes to the animation later when you've gone past this point, it becomes a huge pain. Like your simulations are off, your renders are off, everything's off. So you always want to make sure that layout and animation is done. And layout is basically like the layout of the objects, the, you're working with like the composition with the camera. So where are things going to be placed in your scene? And there's a lot of things you can do to make it look really nice if you study things about cinematography and, and how to make things have a focal point. So we start with the layout and animation, which is what Eddie did in his team. Then we had a simulation pass, which is where we do like the destruction. So we have like the, the rubble and the rocks and all of that stuff. And that's, yeah, that second part. So, and the reason why you want to, again, bake your animations out before you touch simulation is because you'll have to recache and do a whole bunch of calculations all over again in Houdini. And that's a huge pain. And I want to give credit to his name's Urban. Oh man, I can't remember his last name, but <laughs> he's, he's the one that did all the simulation stuff for me and he absolutely killed it. He has a, uh, a studio called uh, theory accelerated accelerated and they make a cool plugin for Houdini. So if you want to learn how to do explosions and fun things like that, um, I would say go visit him. So this is the smoke and fire. You can see we added sparks, all that fun stuff. So yeah, you really want to make sure that like, all of the animations baked because otherwise it just becomes a huge headache, but adding the simulation and all this cool stuff, <laughs> it just gives the scene way more life. So yeah, Axiom, he makes, uh, Urban makes that cool plugin. And then I think I can show you, is this the one with the, so this is the raw animation before the simulation. This is like the layout. Kind of a cool thing. Let's see, it'll play again. So yeah, they really focus on like how the camera moves, who's the camera focused on, the composition where um, the characters are laid out. And then, let's see, this is the breakdown. Okay, so this is a breakdown of kind of what I did. So, Looks all pretty, but there's lots of layers. And we're going to go over kind of this process or in, in comp. In all the compositing, so there's After Effects and then there's Nuke. I did all this compositing in Nuke. And I created those crowds all in Blender. They have a good free, or yeah, Blender's amazing for creating, creating clouds or crowds. And then lighting was in Clarice and that software is no more. <laughs> so Clarice went under, sadly. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a quick breakdown. Once we have the simulation, then in parallel, we kind of had the, uh, up here is the matte painting that my friend Ian Vickner uh, worked on. So he created a 360 dome, and I, and I told him kind of what the mood was, nighttime. It's, a, it's like a battle royale in the middle of a city. So he did this huge matte painting, um, and he did this beautiful planet, so maybe this is you know, set in some other planet. And so you could see some distant, you know, like Jupiter, or another moon, who knows? So while he started doing that, I started working on like the base lighting and I started lighting things. And some of the lighting techniques that um, I used was first you have, so right here, this is like the, the general light. It was like a, an HDRI or environmental light, which is more bluish or greenish. And then I have a bunch of area lights and I love, 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 love putting area lights or lights behind um, characters. There's some, it just, you want to create some separation because if you see in this image, they all, everything's kind of blending together. As soon as you add some backlights and, and lights that give an, a nice silhouette around your objects, it's now separating them from the background. So you're kind of cutting them out with light. So I start using lights and moving them behind to separate them. It's about creating that focus. Um, after that, I added some more like environment lights. I started lighting up the city in the background a little bit more. 
And then I added some spotlight. So you can see right here that uh, above there was no lights from the fence. Like you couldn't see the shadows and the, the lights shining through, the spotlight shining through the fence or on, hit or on our subject. And now you can see a spotlight on the floor. And here's kind of a wide view of those spotlights in this scene. So I was able to create a bunch of spotlights and animate them and they're kind of moving, almost like they're panning and following the action because if this was like a real thing you'd have someone up there in the stadium you know controlling the spotlights following the action so i did kind of the same thing i just created a spotlight and was following the action animating the lights and having lights pass over the crowds and it just kind of gave it much more of an environment feel so once i was happy with like lighting and all that then you go to this mess and does everyone know what this mess is <laughs> so this is uh a, this is the worst example of what you could do in nuke and nuke is where you composite so nuke is a compositing software like after effects but instead of layers like stacking layers and after effects it uses what's called nodes and you have like a tree so you start up here and you slowly go down adding in a bunch of stuff and these blue little nodes are like we're emerging stuff and this is a terrible example of what you shouldn't do in a studio, which is make a huge mess. You can be much more organized and clean these up. So, But I knew I was the only one opening it, and so I kind of was going really, really fast. But if you work at a studio and you work with Nuke, make sure you clean them up because it's embarrassing. So that was a, a fun little node tree. But if you start at the top and go all the way down to the bottom, this is where we're going to have that final image. And these are all different, like, images and stock effects and layers and in different passes to make this thing work and now we're going to talk about that so when i render out an image i will have a bunch of different passes so i'll try to explain kind of like what a pass is so instead of just like an image like you have like a flat colored image like in this top left corner you can have information stored within your image and some of that information is like volume so like smoke or haze and some of it's the diffuse so the colors of the ground or it's the reflections as you can see here so we have like a reflection pass and so there's all these different passes that you can use to help you comp stuff together um, in your final your final look and these colored passes these are basically masks so if you think of like masks and after effect like a roto shape these are different you can export out a, sh a mask for each object and material so that I can use those all together. So it looks crazy, but this is just kind of showing you what was stored in this image, which is, it's a lot. So we're going to start at the top kind of and, and kind of show you what happens along this process. So this is the raw image. It was noisy. It didn't look good. It was, it was exported out in 720, 720p. So it was kind of rough, but I knew with motion blur and a bunch of compositing tricks, I can make it look better than it is. <laughs> so again, while I was working on this over here are the matte paintings that Ian was working on. And you'll see that he had a background Then he took the city. Uh, I sent him some renders of the background of the city and he started painting over them, adding on lights. And then when I merged these together, you'll see that, oh, now we have like a city in the background that looks a little bit better. You know, we're starting to get a little bit more detail. And I didn't have to spend time in 3D modeling every window and every single light. I was able to have a matte painter come in and just paint in Photoshop. And then that painting in Photoshop is put into my scene, which is so much nicer. And you can get a lot more detail out of it. So then I started using those things that I was telling you about, the different masks for the different objects. So you can see, you can, you can select any part of this and it can become a mask. So if I knew, I was like, oh man, the dinosaur is just too dark or his saturation's off or whatever it is, I could select that one mask and say, use that to control the color of like the dinosaur or the robot or any part of his, of his suit. And I can just control the color and the saturation and all that in compositing. So then, and I started adding like little like effects along the way, just some, some little things. Um, so then I had Ian make, I said, Hey, my stadium's looking a little too, you know, it was looking a little too boring right here. I'm like, how can we make this look better? If you see down here, 
we got all this detail now all over the place on the stadium. And Ian went in, he took some frames, he would paint over them. And after he would paint over those frames, the way we get it to stick back on to where it's supposed to be is it's, I could go on and on about this, but it's called projections. I can take the objects from my 3D scene and project this detail onto them. And so I'm able, it, it's able to stick and look like we just had more detail in uh, 3D. So yeah, just more matte paintings and projections onto the environment. Then I uh, created this crowd in Blender. You can see this beautiful crowd. There's a plugin. Um, it's not that expensive. And Blender's nice because it's free. Like I'm trying to rebuild this whole scene right now in Blender to see if it's um, how it holds up. But you can create this crowd in Blender super easy. And they come textured and everything. And then I rendered them out as a completely separate pass. So was, when I say pass, it means just them with like a transparent background. And the reason why they were able to stay is because I was using the same camera Im information. Like I said at the beginning, we baked all of that animation. So the same camera was, has been used in Nuke. It's been using Clarice. It's been used in Blender. We're using the same baked camera. So it matches perfectly. And make sure you're using the same frame rate as well. <laughs> Otherwise, it won't work. So once we um, added the crowd and then we took that volume pass. So this is those like the environment volume that we created, those light rays. And this is all done in 3D. And our emissions pass, which is anything in emissions, anything that glows. So those lights, his boosters, the fire. And we bring those together with our crowds. Now we're starting to get, okay, we have a crowd. We got the boosters coming in there, you know, going from up there to down here it's starting to come together and that environment that uh, fog is starting to really help blend things. And you'll see right now that the crowd doesn't look very well comped in. And that's because later down the chain, I added a bunch more smoke and then it, it started looking more correct. Like they started f fading into the background and the background got faded more. So you'll see. Um, then using again, more masks from, um, from the you know the robot or whatever and this is called a depth map so this is another pass that you can get this is how you can create depth of field in in compositing this is how you can pull masks so that you can even make it look like characters are running through smoke but depth pass was really helpful because then i could comp in some dust i could comp in smoke effects spark effects and a bunch of stuff into, into this scene. So now we're getting depth, we're getting uh, smoke and a bunch of other cool stuff. And there was another effect and it's hard to see right here, but I had the dinosaur have spit in his mouth and I didn't want to do that in 3D because I was like too lazy to do a whole simulation. So what I ended up doing is I took the geometry into Nuke. You can bring the 3D animated geometry into Nuke and I found some, a slime stock photo and I was able to put it in his mouth and animate it and stretch it. And it just gave the illusion that, oh, he's got spit in his mouth and screen that over or add it over and voila, suddenly a dinosaur spit in his mouth. So sometimes there's things that we spend a long time in 3D, like trying to rig up this whole thing and Houdini. And, and a lot of times you can get away with this stuff. If it's really fast, a lot of motion blur, it's all about the context. You can just, create the whole effect in Nuke and in compositing. And I think this is a step that a lot of 3D artists just kind of forget. They're like, oh, I rendered it out of Octane with some glows and I'm going to put it up. And it's like, to me, you're missing a whole nother step of adding that, that, that next level. And so going into comp, you can really start amping up your renders. So now we're starting to get somewhere, starting to look a lot nicer. And now look at this. This is so funny. <laughs> The camera, once you turn the motion blur on, <laughs> it suddenly all is blending together. And that's what always makes me laugh. Because, you know, if this would have been a slower moving shot, not as much movement, I probably would have spent more time on some stuff. But I thought, you know, the camera's moving, the characters are moving. It's very fast. Um, so I didn't worry about a lot of stuff because I thought it's all going to be covered up by motion blur, depth of field, and a bunch of other stuff. I kind of was 
you know, trying to get to the end result as fast as I could. And so I, but I knew in context, oh, the shot's moving fast. We can get away with some stuff. So yeah, it starts looking more cinematic and a lot cooler. And the motion blur was all done in Nuke. I just used the uh, Nuke motion blur. Um, normally it's probably better to do render out what's called a motion vector pass. That's another pass that can give you data and information on how motion blur actually works. But I just did it quickly. Um, <clears throat> then I started adding lens effects. And this is probably my favorite part, which, which is the, you know, the most fun is making things pretty, adding lens flares and all the good stuff. Um, so I made a bunch of cool lens flares. I attached them to lights in 3D. And so we were able to get cool anamorphic flares. But then there's some other things. And I'll tell you some of my favorite tricks with uh, creating quote unquote film looking uh, effects. And it's the certain type of glow. So there's a glow that's called, and you can see it right here. It's kind of a red fringe and you'll see it a, a couple different places on the really, really bright spots. And some people think that's called chromatic aberration, but there's one other thing called halation. And halation is an effect that happens in film where there's the film cameras used to reflect really, really bright things back with red. So you'll see it all the time in old movies. You'll look at old lamp posts and there'll be like a red fringe around it. And I, and you can kind of sometimes see that even in digital cameras, you'll see either purple or green, depending on the digital camera, you'll start seeing a little fringe on really, really bright spots and adding those little teeny, teeny details are things that are going to give your renders much more photorealistic quality. And so if you study, like if you're ever studying, like, what cameras you should, you know, what look you want, study the cameras they're shot, shot on. Um, if it's shot on a Sony camera, if it's shot on a red and say, okay, what does the grain look like on film? What does the grain look like or the noise on a red or an area Alexa, these different cameras, because CG renders, in my opinion, are too clean. They always come out way too sharp and too clean. And a lot of people you talk to that work in the industry at big studios, are like, oh yeah, we blur it. <laughs> like we blur it. Like, you know, a couple pixels, it's too sharp, it's too clean. And so you always want to dirty up your renders if, if you're going for the more filmic, cinematic, quote unquote, cinematic look, is you want to make it feel like this thing was filmed through a camera. So what happens when we film through camera? Well, there's lens distortion. You know, you're going to get, so you add some lens distortion. There's chromatic aberration. There's going to be halation. There's going to be some diffusion. There'll be some blooms. There'll be some lens flares. There'll be noise. There'll be grain. Adding that next, and I do this at the very end, and adding in all those little things is really what's going to start making it feel like not just like a render, but man, that's like something out of a movie that, you know, I had a lot of people ask me when I posted this, they're like, what movie is this from? <laughs> and we had a lot of people be like, what movie? And I was like, it's not a movie. It's just for fun with some friends, you know, collaborating. We had a good time. But I, that to me is like the greatest compliment because I was like, that's my dream. Obviously, work on film, make a film. And so I was like, yes, we achieved it. It looks like it's something shot in a film. So that's kind of the last step was that adding in all those effects and um, all those blooms. And that's how we got to that result. Yeah, this is uh, VFX Central or VFX-Central.com for now. It will eventually, every, that will redirect to VFXCentral.net. I'm updating a whole bunch of fun stuff on here my courses and everything. It's been a mess. And then I'm also just, yeah, Instagram. Uh, yeah, VFX under dash central. And my YouTube channel, because I do a bunch of education stuff. So I have free stuff on here. And then I have my paid for stuff on my website. But yeah, you can find me here, VFX central, um, After Effects compositing stuff, um, Cinema 4D, Redshift, bunch of fun stuff in there. I have new stuff coming out. I recently did a poll. Um, if you see it on my community tab and you guys take the poll too, it's interesting because I asked people if they wanted more tutorials or what type of content. And a lot of people said, hey, VFX shorts and breakdown. So I think that's where I'm going to start moving, where I create something and then I um, teach and I show how to create it. So look forward to that. Again, uh, thank you so much, Aaron for your presentation and I hope that you would have a wonderful rest of the evening and see you next time. <laughs>